Do you want to change the world? So do I. On this show, we meet artists whose work is doing just that. Welcome to Art Heals All Wounds. I'm your host, Pam Uzel. You know, aging isn't for the faint of heart. And while I am partially speaking of my own experience when I say this, I'm mostly saying this from watching loved ones grow older, into their 80s, their 90s even. In so many ways, getting older becomes a process of losing things. Maybe it's a decrease in your physical strength. Maybe it's losing your friends. I think the hardest thing, though, might be losing your autonomy, that freedom to go where you want, when you want. For example, you might lose your ability to hop on a bus and go see your family whenever you want because the bus trip is very long and it involves crossing a border. But you've always loved your family and looked after them, giving them as much support and guidance as you could. What do you do at this point in your life when you know that your time is coming to an end, but the love you have for your life and everyone in it is still so strong? When Julian Moreno was 89, he was no longer able to make the frequent trips from his home in Durango, Mexico, to visit his children and grandchildren in the United States. Instead, he started building a house for them right next door to his own. And he also became the willing subject of his granddaughter's documentary film about him. Filmmaker Ileana Sosa began a seven-year process of frequently visiting her grandfather at his home and filming him. Ileana's documentary film, What We Leave Behind, is a portrait of her grandfather, of his life in Durango, of him building this home as a gift for his scattered family, and of the relationship he's building with her. Together, they share the creative endeavor of documenting a life and all the ordinary daily rituals of family that express love. Ileana Sosa is a filmmaker from El Paso, Texas, raised by Mexican immigrant parents. She's made several narrative films, and What We Leave Behind is her first feature documentary. Ileana had so many things she wanted to know and document about her grandfather, maybe focusing on his time as a bracero, and the details of his romance with her grandmother, who passed away while her grandfather was still a young parent with seven children to raise. One of the beauties of documentary film, though, is that you have to follow where the story takes you. I've asked Ileana on the podcast to share what she found while making this beautiful film. Hi, Ileana. Thank you so much for being on Art Heals All Wounds. Can you start by telling us who you are and what you do? Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It's a, it's a real pleasure. Uh, my name is Ileana Sosa. I'm a filmmaker based in Austin, originally from El Paso, from the frontera. So I, I very much consider myself a fronteriza. And I'm also uh, an assistant professor at RTF in UT Austin, where I teach film production, primarily focusing on documentary. And this year I wrapped post-production and now my film is in distribution on my first feature documentary called uh, What We Leave Behind. Um, and in Spanish, the title is Lo Que Dejamos Atrás. Mm. That's really what I wanted to talk to you about. I saw this beautiful film, What We Leave Behind, on Netflix, and it's a very incredibly moving and touching portrait of your grandfather. 
And also a portrait, I think, of your relationship that builds. And I had so many questions and things I wanted to talk to you about after watching it. So first of all, before we get into any of those, can you just briefly describe what is contained in this film? Yes. So what we leave behind is a personal documentary uh, about my grandfather, Julian Moreno, who at the age of 89, before he passed away, decided to build a house in his little town in rural Mexico, in Durango. And, you know, the family wasn't quite sure why he wanted to build a house at that age, but he did. And it was his big, um, you know, last accomplishment before he passed. And so the film chronicles the construction of this house, but also my relationship with him. And before he embarked on this project, he also traveled very frequently back and forth between Mexico and the U.S. on these long bus rides. And so he takes his last bus ride from Texas to Durango and then embarks on this project. Yes. And, you know, what the way that this film is set up and your relationship and this going for your grandfather to go back on the bus it's really interesting because there are times when you have your voiceover and you talk about how when you were younger, your grandfather was a mystery to you and you didn't know how to talk to him. And I'm really curious about this relationship that you built with him while filming. It's, it's a very odd thing for your granddaughter to come and film you, I imagine, but it also is a great way to um, build a relationship. I'm wondering what that was like. Can you talk a little bit about this mystery of your grandfather and learning how to talk to him? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I grew up with him coming every month. So he'd come every month, spend a day or two in El Paso, and then go on to Albuquerque where I have other extended family and he did this for many years, over 20 years, coming back and forth. And why I say he was a mystery to me was because even though I, I'm fluent in Spanish, you know, he spoke a very specific dialect that's regional to Durango and to that uh, specific area of Mexico. And sometimes I didn't understand him, actually couldn't understand what he was saying. And the, you know, generational gap too, I think, you know, I didn't really know who he was. I mean, I knew stories about him and the stories he would tell when he'd come. And he'd always bring certain things, certain candy or chile or something from the homeland to my mom. And there was always an exchange of goods, but it was in many ways very transactional where I just remember him bringing stuff. We'd give stuff to him to take to the family there. But I never had at length conversations with him about his experiences and primarily about his experiences as a bracero. And so during World War II, the U.S. government contracted Mexican farm workers to work the fields all over the U.S. because there was an absence of labor. And my grandfather was one of these men, and many of these men passed away and so have their stories. And that's when I initially, you know, embarked on this documentary back in 2014. I wanted to know more about that, like more about those travels, where he farmed, what states, like what did he, what, what did he pick? And he picked everywhere from cotton to strawberries to beets. I mean, all, all over. And there was, so that's, that was my initial interest. And then afterwards, you know, I also wanted to know how did he raise seven children on his own being a single father? Because my grandmother passed away when they were very young or he was very young. So all of this intrigued me, right? But I think I didn't have the language to really ask those questions. And first there was the language barrier, but also I think cultural and just generational differences. And so that's how I embarked on the, on the project. And then slowly he, you know, I asked him if I could film him and he was, you know, I think he, he, he at first I think thought I was just photographing him or just taking photos, not really <laughs> filming. Um, <laughs> And that was really special because he really became a very integral part of the project the very, very soon. And yeah, he later, I think, really enjoyed me coming down there. I didn't go every year to film, but when I did, he, he really liked it. It was very an active part of the, of the process. Right. And I, I have no idea what you wound up with in all the filming that you did, but this film felt 
very much more about your grandfather's role both in the family and in your life and sort of his everyday life and his building of relationships with people around him as opposed to anything about him being a bracero or whatever other historical thing that you wanted to ask him. And really, this could be my own lens, but it's a really beautiful thing to be able to deepen a relationship with someone as they're aging. And your grandfather does talk a lot about, you know, death approaching. And in a certain way, it's kind of watching, for me, your grandfather kind of come to terms with that grief of aging. You know, he was not able to take those bus trips anymore. And he has an adult son with a disability who he's probably very, very worried about. And I'm wondering what you think about his response to start building a house in this particular time in his life. What did you think about that ultimately? Yeah. I mean, ultimately the family, when he first embarked on the project, it was about a year and a half before he actually passed away or took him about a year to build the house. And shortly thereafter, he he got sick. But we didn't really know and we didn't understand. But we did understand, and I certainly understood, that he was not one to just sit around. (laughs) He was not a person that he would just sit and watch TV for hours. That was not him. He was always very active and always out outside and in the sun and farming or just out and talking to people. He was a very social person in that way where he was always active. And if he didn't have something to do, he would make up something to do, you know, go (laughs) into town and buy some groceries, even though he had gone the other day. So he just didn't sit still too much. And I think that's also you know, it really allowed him to live a long, a, a really long and, and, and beautiful life. But for me, when I saw him embark on this at his age, you know, my grandfather was always a very welcoming person to his in his home, even if a stranger would come by and need a place to stay or food, he'd always offer everybody, anyone that came to his house, he'd always offer them something to eat, you know, ask, did you eat? You know, do you want something? And so I just feel like that was an extension already of his, of this very welcoming nature that he had is like, okay, I'm going to have a little bit of money. I want to embark on this and make a space where if someone wants to come back, they're not going to, they're going to have a place to come home to. Right. And and so that's how I, I saw it, that he wanted to build a place or, you know, extend the house. So if there was ever family in the U S that decided to move back, to Mexico permanently, or maybe not, or just go for an extended period of time, there wouldn't be a concern of like, where am I going to stay? And and so that's what I saw. And also, in later conversations, it seemed that he wanted to possibly live there with my uncle Jorge, because it was smaller and more compact, especially because he has a disability. But then when he finished it, you know, they stayed in the main house. And so, you know, it remains... I don't know. It's a question, right? Like, what were the intentions? But I think beyond that, it's beyond the question of like, why did he decide to do this? But for me, it, it resonates with me because it just shows who he was, right? As a as a person and this this person who wanted to make sure people felt welcomed, no matter who they were. Well, in the film, you talk about this story that your grandfather had told you about the house with a hundred doors. And that that was a story that you loved. And so he took you to see this house of a hundred doors. And can you tell what the story behind this house is? Yeah. So very early on, I think the first trip that I took down there, I went with my mom and I just took a small camera with me. It was just myself and, and she came with me. And my grandfather wanted to show me this this house. And I was always intrigued about it too, because it's this structure this very old house that's falling apart and it's in the middle of the town of this uh, of Primo de Verdad and I wanted to know the story of it and when we went there together and I start, I filmed a little bit with him he told me the story and, and it's a house that was built a really long time ago like during the Mexican Revolution 
I guess a Spanish woman lived there with her husband and she said that she would marry him if she if he built a house that had a hundred doors and that's why it's called the house of a hundred doors and I just thought wow that's a very interesting proposition to someone to say hey I'll marry you but you got to build me this house in a very specific way and it's an interesting story and I, I love it because it also shows and later in the film, my grandfather talks about um, how he met my grandmother and how he just saw her and they started talking and that was it. And then they just, you know, that was the, that was that was how they formed the family. And I thought, oh, that same story in a way resonated with me because it's not as simple, but it almost feels like very in tune with just the gender and cultural dynamics of that generation, right? Which nowadays. I think is it's it's a way more complicated. It's not so straightforward. Right, right. Well, one thing I was wondering about it though is this idea of building, especially a house, as an expression of love. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, because it seemed like that in a certain way and longing too. I mean, I I felt there was a longing for more of a reunification of the family or or just to create the possibility of that for your grandfather. Yeah, and I'm I'm glad you point that out because yeah, in many ways and I love that story too because it parallels his own like construction of this of the house he's making. And you know, I think a big one of the reasons why my grandfather would spend very few days in the U.S. when he did come visit us and other, uh, you know, his other daughters and, and his other son was because he always worried about my uncle Jorge. He'd never want to leave him, uh, you know, he'd never want to be away for too long. Mm. And I think in many ways, I think my grandfather wished all of them would, were together in one place, but that was never possible because... Jorge and another aunt, my other aunt, Edmina, were never able to, you know, get visas, and especially Jorge because of his disability. And so that was that was a huge, I think, concern in the sense that they tried for many years, and my grandfather, I think, wanted to, to be able to take Jorge to the U.S. And, or just have the family in one place, but that was never possible. So in many ways, the story of A Hundred Doors and also just the construction of this house, I think, parallels this wish perhaps, right, that to just have everyone in one place. Yeah. That's actually a really heartbreaking detail about your uncle Jorge not able to get a visa because of his disability. That's actually, yeah. yeah. I really did feel like a very, very strong feeling of grief in this film, but not, not, do you know what I mean? It's, it's sort of like that everyday grief of things in life that are happening that happen you're aging you're losing your health you have worries things that are not tied up or taken care of but your time is coming to a close but i'm really curious about your own grief being there for his passing and then making this film i'm wondering what role making the film played for you i feel like with this film, I didn't really understand how much grief not only our family went through, but I mean, myself included, because I was so focused on trying to finish this film. <laughs> and my goal had been to, I wanted to finish this film before he passed. I didn't expect to film for this long. I didn't expect it to take seven years to make. I didn't expect to even you know, film him constructing a house. That was never the, the intention. Right. I didn't know that was going to happen, right? But in documentary, sometimes you just don't know the story shifts and takes you in a different direction. And when we were in post-production, you know, I it was really hard for me to do the sound design of this film and just the mixing of it, um, seeing some of those images over and over and also just hearing certain phrases that my grandfather would say over and over was really really hard but I don't think I realized the impact of it and the grief that I had until we really finished the film and had our first screening uh, this was in Mexico City and then I just I just broke down afterwards um, I think I had been holding it for so long just 
to finish, right? I just, for me, I just needed to finish. And in many ways, I wanted to keep that promise. And my grandfather often asked my mother, like, oh, do you think Ileana's ever going to finish the film? <laughs> do you think, you know, is she going to, like, you know, and when she does, do you think I'll be able to go, like, to the premiere? Because he loved to travel. And I, I certainly, of course, you know, I wanted him to be part of that. And in many ways he has, even though he's he's not here right now, but he's, the beauty of this film has been it's traveled everywhere, all over the U.S. and in all sorts of different communities. And that's been really touching because it, it you know, not only Latinx communities are touched by it, but everyone, like so many people from different classes and races and backgrounds. And that's been really, really amazing to see. But I think the grief in many ways continues. I, you know, for me, it's really hard to watch the film like fully again. Um, we've been having a lot of theatrical screenings, which I feel very blessed that we have had that opportunity, but I still can't quite sit through it, you know, mm. each time. And so I think, I think that conversation keeps going. And I, I sometimes feel like that everyday grief or pain doesn't quite go away, right? It, it ebbs and flows. and now I think it's shifting to the point where I'm just happy the film is out there and people are connecting with it in the way. And so uh, really grateful for that. Right, right. Well, I think so many of us have gone through that process of watching someone that we love. There are such beautiful scenes that I think are just so wonderful that you included them. Like when he makes you the egg. And, you know, yeah. that's that's just, I mean, I'm so curious, like, how it even came about to film a scene like that. Did he, I mean, it also seemed like he wanted to, again, do something, but also feed you, make sure you've eaten. So how would that come up that you would film him making an egg for you? Yeah, I really wanted to capture just the everyday life there and sort of his routine, right? I mean, that's why we have some scenes where he's just sorting beans. I mean, he would do that almost every day. <laughs> Or, you know, he'd always make himself breakfast because it was usually just Jorge and him. Like in the morning, sometimes I have a, well, sometimes my cousin, uh, Rosi and, and her mom would come every other day or they, they take turns going like to take care of them or make some food. But usually in the mornings, it was just themselves. And so I wanted to capture that and capture his uh, his daily routine. But and that's that's how that happened. I just happened to be filming and he was making the, the egg. And But I think that, that also shows just how, what a caring nature, you know, that my grandfather had. And um, Unless you were a fly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Unless you were a fly. Because he, he, he had a, they were like his arch enemy, the flies. So. Which were two of my favorite scenes were around the <laughs> swatting of the flies. Yeah. So I'm sorry I interrupted mm -hmm. you, but I just. Oh no, no, not at all. I, no. I, but yeah, like I, yeah, I, I love the, the scene where he's trying to swat them. And then really my favorite is when the little girl who's sitting with him, is that your, um, is that? A, yeah, that's my cousin's daughter, Marisol. Marisol, yeah, when she's his granddaughter. So he's, <laughs> he's, I can't remember if it was that scene or a previous one. He mentions that he has a hard time seeing them. And so she's like at the table and she like points out the fly. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it becomes almost as good as Yeah. Game. She's and, just so, yeah. she's so <laughs> adorable too, sitting there. Mm -hmm. Like they, they have mm -hmm. their partnership where they're tackling this issue of the flies together, which is just another amazing yeah. scene in there. <laughs> um, so, you know, and there was one more question I wanted to ask you about this bridge that your mom, did I get this correct in the story? Your mom was the first person to leave to go to the United States. Yes, of the, of the siblings. Like my grandfather had been before and then she left around 14. Right, right. And so she, you tell a story about her having a nightmare about having to cross a swinging bridge. Is that, and then she mm -hmm. actually did have to cross yeah. a bridge. I'm so curious about including that detail in your film. What did that signify for you to include this little story of your family? Yeah. I mean, when I started making this film, I started asking more questions, you know, to my mom, to my aunts, to my uncles about their journeys coming to the, to the U.S. And so, yeah, this one story always intrigued me of how 
she was 14 and she came to El Paso and that's where she met my father. I mean, years, years later and crossed a bridge that exists. It's called the Black Bridge actually. And during the seventies, a lot of undocumented people would cross, you know, to that bridge. And it was a little, it was way easier to, you know, cross back then in that way. Um, and she crossed this bridge that's known as a Black Bridge, but she'd have dreams of it before she even left her hometown that she was going to cross it. I mean, and so I was always intrigued by that. But for me, it is important to include because, you know, I'm first generation Mexican American. You know, I was born in El Paso and I have the privilege of, of being able to cross back and forth because of, I have a U.S. passport. And my mother and, you know, my other family hasn't had that opportunity. I mean, now she's a U.S. citizen. But at the time, I thought how... I could not imagine being 14 and crossing in that way or coming to a foreign country in that way and leaving everything behind to, to help your family. I mean, essentially that's why she left to help my grandfather and her siblings and started working as a nanny and as a housekeeper. And I just found that so wild. Like, I mean, I couldn't, at 14, I was so immature and so like spoiled. I just, I couldn't imagine leaving and, and, and starting a life on the, and trying to help my family out. I just, I don't know. So those stories to me always intrigue me. And that fortitude and resilience, um, I know are very much part of me, but I, I still feel like I will, I don't know, never be as strong as, as them. Like, I don't think, I, I just, I just can't imagine. Yeah, I, watching this film, I feel like it needs to be included as a quintessential American story you know, about family, about this border that we try to solidify in various different ways. But in fact, in fact, there are, there are such an, you know, America could choose to see that there's a huge extended family of Americans, you know, in our neighboring country. And so I, this is one thing I love about your film is that it, does show something that I think, not just American, but North American, I think we really need to rethink our position on this continent. And when I say we, I mean the U.S. We need to rethink it and think about borders a lot and think about them differently as, you know, how amazing it is that we have the neighbors that we have, because it actually is. And there's nothing in your film that was overtly political or anything about borders. It was a beautiful, poetic portrait of a family and people of different generations, you know, coming to know each other through this film. And I thought it was very beautiful in that sense. Um, also, a lot of the, there are other little stories. I'll ask you one more and then. I'll let you get on with your busy day, which I know you have. Mm -hmm. The story of, you talk about when you were driving one time and your grandfather was sick and he starts banging on the, he's, I guess he's in the back seat and he starts like tapping mm -hmm. or hitting the back of your seat and he wants to get in front in case you get lost because this was his land. I'm wondering if you can talk about including that story, just the, such provocative ideas of you getting lost and that he's concerned about that. I mean, it does show him as a caretaker, which he definitely seemed to be. But why did you include that story? Yeah, I mean, that story, and I still remember that moment, and it it's, has stayed with me so long. I mean, yeah, we he, he was really sick, and my mother and I had gone down to Durango. He was in the hospital. And the doctor said, look, you, you guys should come down or whoever, whoever family wants to come down because he's uh, he's going to pass away soon. So, you know, when you get that call, okay, we went down and I drove him back to his town because he was in, in the capital city in Durango and his town of Primo de Lula is like two hours away. And so I rented a car and drove him back. And Jorge was there too, and usually would always sit in the front. He liked to sit in the front. He wouldn't drive, but he liked to sit in the front and tell me or whoever was driving where to go because he really knew the land like the back of his hand. I mean, he had spent so many years there. 
but at that time he had he could not speak anymore he he mm. he had lost his voice he couldn't speak he couldn't communicate and we were all shocked because um he found a way to we thought he needed to use a restroom he was banging on the on the back of, of my seat. My mom was in the car. Jorge was there, and no, he wanted to sit up front. He, in his place, and that was his place as this patriarch, right, of the family, who was both mother and father. He was there up front, like guiding all the time, and and that scene was so heartbreaking to me because for for you know one reason, the fact that I was I was the person who who brought him back home, and to have that gift, right. But also just uh, showed up my relationship with him and how, in many ways, he guided this film, the making of it, um, from the very beginning and still continues to. He really is the driving force behind this film. And I know he's not here to see it, but I'm going to be forever grateful to him. Yeah. Yeah. It's an incredible, incredible tribute. And I think, I think there's a, you know... There's such a universality about it, which I love. And I also love the specificity of, you know, your family. It's a really beautiful portrait. Um, so thank you for spending those seven years making this. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad it resonated with you the way it did. And I'm, I'm so happy to hear that you describe it as, uh, because in many ways, it is, you know, this is just a portrait of, and I like to say, like a modern American family. You know, even though we happen to live on different countries, separated by a man-made border fence, <laughs> but right, right. you know, we are, we are in many ways just a portrait of just the complexities of, of, of a modern American family and what it's like to live in in a, in, in this world today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Ileana, can you tell us where people can see this film? There's a great opportunity, actually, for everybody to see this film. So where can they see this film and where can they learn more about your other work? Yeah. Um, so, you know, thankfully, the film um, got distribution this year, which we're very excited about. Um, Ava DuVernay's company, Array. Uh, the nonprofit side of, of her company um, dis is distributing the film and it is on Netflix now. Mm. So um, a lot of people can watch it <laughs> and it's very accessible. And so it's online and it's streaming um, and that's where people can check it out. And for my other work, I have a website. It's just uh, my, my first and last name, ilianasosa.com. Okay, well, thank you. And I, I really, anybody who has a patriarch or a matriarch who has played a huge role in the shaping of their family will connect with this film. So I hope a lot of people do watch it. Thank you so much. You're listening to Art Heals All Wounds. Thank you so much to Ileana Sosa for being on the podcast to talk about her film, What We Leave Behind. This film is a very American story of how to keep the ties with family, especially across borders. It's currently on Netflix. If you've ever had a patriarch or matriarch who is the center of your family, you'll be deeply moved by this film, and you'll be reminded of all the little things that add up as a way to express love. Thank you so much for listening to Art Heals All Wounds. This is our last full episode of the season, but I'll be releasing a short wrap-up next week. In the meantime, catch up on any previous episodes you've missed, and don't forget to follow us on whatever app you listen on and share the show with a friend. The music you've heard in this podcast is by Ketza and Lobo Loco. This podcast was edited by Eva Hristova. Art Heals All Wounds comes to you from Oakland, California, 
on unceded territory of the Chokenyo Ohlone people. Thank you.